I'm Damien the DM from Adventures in Aurelia, a collaborative storytelling experience told through a game of Dungeons and Dragons, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other epically geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Welcome to episode 275 of Better Podcasting. On this show, we help you connect to your audience through social media. In this week's Better Podcasting download, we go technical and explain what might be a cause for your failed multi-site video recording. And finally, in this week's Better Podback, we highlight some of the podcasting conversations from our Discord server. Lauren, start the show now. You're always the conversation to us. This is Better Podcasting. We are hobby podcasters through and through, just like you. That's why we are different. We minimize the money talk so that you can focus on building a better podcast. Episode 275 of Better Podcasting is brought to you by the letters S and P. And he's here today, too. Hey everybody, how's it going? We are well into our season three of Better Podcasting, talking about the audience and how to involve the audience and how to grow your audience. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Now, we normally start with a how I saved my podcast story. And full disclosure, we have one. We have one that's been submitted and we're just going to play it next week, not this week. So if you have a how I played your how I saved or played your podcast story, <laughs> go ahead and send it into us and we will put it in the schedule to play on a future episode of Better Podcasting. For sure. We'd love to hear from you, but we've got a very exciting episode today because we're going to talk a little bit about social media. Yes, because turning strangers into friends is one of the best ways to grow a hobby podcast. As crazy as it might sound, it's true. And we're not just talking about magic potions like the ones that SP does on the weekend. No, we're talking about putting yourself out there on social media and engaging with strangers that might eventually come check out your podcast. Yes, last week we did talk all about expanding outside of your social circles, and we were talking about the community aspect, but we briefly touched a little bit about social media. Well, really, social media is a topic in itself, which is why today it is literally a topic in itself that we're going to talk about. For some podcasters, social media is a little bit, though, like a third hand. It's always there at your fingertips. You've used it successfully for years, and adding your podcast to the mix is just a swipe of the finger away, especially if you swipe right for SP. For some podcasters that either didn't grow up with social media or have more of a, you know, they're a little bit more reserved to begin with. Social media can be a stretch and a chore that you'd rather scrub your bathtub first before logging into one of those sites. Now, whether you love it or hate it, social media is not only one of the modern pillars of promotion and outreach, but for anyone without a huge advertisement budget, i.e. most hobby podcasters, Social media is your first and primary means to advertise your show and gain exposure outside of your existing sphere of influence. But as a hobby podcaster, odds are that you cannot spend 80 hours a week scrolling your feeds. It's just not going to happen. You have a full-time job. You're going to school full-time. You might have a part-time job. And then you got hobby podcasts on top of exercising, cooking, cleaning, fixing your cars, mowing the grass, spraying for ants, all those things that you have to do throughout the year. So for the next few minutes, we're going to help you break down your social media use to maximize your time and fun, because hobby podcasting is all about fun, while hopefully promoting your podcast and connecting to your audience. Now let's start by taking a look at some considerations that you're going to have while using social media to help expand your podcast reach. First consideration you might want to have is that hobby podcasting is time management. So you need to balance the time management. Is social media going to be worth it for your specific hobby podcast endeavors? You're probably pretty busy as it is producing your episodes or seasons of your podcast. And that's going to involve things like research, maybe creating in-show audio clips, writing outlines for your podcast, creating a script 
and you're also going to prepare your thoughts. And then it doesn't stop there because the process continues. We've talked about this. There's a whole bunch of steps with creating a podcast. You need to record your podcast, and that involves things like setup, recording, which honestly is probably the easiest part. You're going to have to afterwards save your files, tear down whatever you set up to record, and then you rinse and repeat for every single episode that you end up creating for your podcast. But then it continues, SP. You got to edit the show. How much time are you going to put in there? Many hobby podcasters spend at least a few hours on this part per episode. And some podcasters spend a significant more amount of time than just that. And then you have to publish, which involves things like creating blog posts, maybe tagging your podcast, uploading the audio file. And then after you get through all that, you need to promote. And that is where you maybe bring social media into it. Right. So when you're promoting after all that, do you have the energy to do this? Do you have the time to do this? Do you have the time to do it often enough? And then And the bottom line is how much return on investment or ROI, as it's called in the industry, do you get out of the time and effort spent into social media? Now, only you are going to be able to answer the question of the return on investment, whether or not it's worth it to you. But there aren't many forms out there that you can talk directly with your audience outside of social media. So that's what it's all about. And it's time to spend some time at least in social media so you can connect to your audience outside of, well, your podcast studio. So some of the considerations for social media that are addition to time is social media is crowded. It's very crowded these days. A lot of people have figured out how to work it. A lot of people like to work it. Nearly just about everybody in the United States that would be worth connecting to the podcast has a smartphone and smartphone has access to social media. And some of the competition that you're going to be facing in social media from other people that post probably in your space are things like influencers or industry stars or funny or interactive graphics. You know, the people that put a lot of effort into their posts. I have no idea how they come up with all that much time, but some of them do. And then meaningful and entertaining video clips things like Instagram or TikToks out there. That's kind of what that's focused, but you can get the same thing on Mastodon or Twitter or any of the other social media as well. And then you're competing with people that are posting multiple times a day, a lot of times, multiple times an hour. There are some very prolific posters out there in different social media and their audiences love it. You know, sometimes I would say for a hobby podcaster not to post too much, but there are people out there that post just ton of stuff each hour and they get engagement from that. So you're competing with that. And remember that social media often is somebody's full-time job, especially if you're competing like with hobby podcasts and you might be reviewing like a TV show or a movie or something like that. The studio, I guarantee you has at least one, if not multiple full-time people that are working their social media. And that is who you're competing with for attention to the same people that might be interested in it. And it doesn't have to be movies or TV. It's just what I'm familiar with. It could be any other industry too. Plus, remember, everybody has an opinion on the internet these days. Everybody. And you don't have to be an expert to post or comment that opinion. So you're competing with that. Uh, There are some areas as well that are more closed groups, or you might call it established echo chambers. And what I'm talking about here is things like GroupMe or a Slack channel that you have to be invited into. There's no public access into it. That's a closed community. And in order to get into that, you have to befriend somebody and you have to be valuable and stuff like that in order to even get invited to begin with. And then you have to, again, wonder if it's going to be worth it to post to a limited amount of people in there, right? And then Many people posting on the same topic means you get lost in the sea of conversation. Think of it in terms of you're out on the sea, you're a single boat, and everybody can see you for miles around because you're that one boat. But then there's a big storm that kicks up. You got 50 mile an hour winds, 70 mile an hour winds. The sea is churning. You got clouds overhead, so you can't fly an airplane over and see from on top. You get lost in all of that. And that's what social media 
is these days. And another consideration that I want to talk about, or Stephen, you want to jump in here, is with the algorithm. For sure. Because you need to think about the algorithm. Is your social media being distributed where getting noticed is a little bit more difficult? For example, Twitter has been pushing a new algorithm style that some users have expressed that has become a little harder for smaller creators to get their content seen. Basically, the smaller creators are having their content buried amongst the bigger tweeters, the, the people who are spending a lot more time on them, on it, the more prominent people. On TikTok, you've got viewers that are tending to get locked into a certain theme or type of content for a very extended period. Essentially, people start watching a video, the algorithm will start feeding them a very similar videos over and over and over. And it's only after they deviate a little bit from that, do they start to get fed other content. So if you're not in that theme, well, good luck. And then another area is on like Mastodon. You've got a different problem, which is almost the opposite of this, where Mastodon's kind of at the moment, kind of like early social media, where it's very direct connection based. So it's sort of hard to break outside of those people that you're directly interacting with. There are some options, but they're pretty limited possibilities. Primarily, you're only looking at expanding through hashtags over there. And then on Facebook, you're fighting to get your content seen between the many, many, many ads that seem endless in the timeline now. So if you're not an ad, well, people might not notice because they might think you're an ad because there's so many over there. So you really need to consider all of these different things on social media and almost try to break that algorithm or at least break through it. This might mean considering things like asking, do your posts or your messages or your social media content, do, do they interact with the right type of people or is it the wrong type of responses like trolls? Are you interacting with real people or bots? Are you making posts that are coming off as authentic or are they coming off more bot-like because you risk alienating a bunch of people if they think that you are bots? Yeah, and you got to make sure that you make that personal connection during your posts and you're not just posting some mechanical posts. And we'll get to that later. So another consideration that we want to talk about right off the bat is do you use your personal account or a branded account? This is a big question that gets asked all the time. So you need to consolidate your efforts into an, one account. And if you do that, you may enable you to concentrate all of that effort. And then you get that ROI and you're breaking that algorithm with that one account versus distributing it to your personal accounts. A personal account might be too diverse to gain your podcast's attention or the attention of the algorithm or the attention of people looking for similar sorts of content on the social media that you are using. You might like to share those login credentials of that branded account that I was talking about with a podcast team and the team members with that branded account. And here are some best practices right off the bat for that shared account. You need to sign posts, or maybe you should sign posts that share an opinion or an individual message. And we do it all the time on Better Podcasting. And back in the day on, on the Guinea Geek account, we would put our initials at least at the end, just so the reader would know who they were talking to. And another thing is you should use we or third-party terms when making posts about the podcast or general content and not just your opinion if you share that branded account. If it's just you, you might want to go with you. But I've seen many people that are like a solo business person that have used we instead of I. And I think that's to give the appearance that the team is bigger than it actually is. And there might there might be something in the human psyche that goes, oh, well, this is more valuable content or not. I don't know the answer to that. I don't care. But it's just something that actually happens out there. And I've seen it happen in podcasting spaces too. Another thing that I don't think needs to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're on a social media platform, you treat those direct messages or those private messages as they could be exposed at any time. They could be public and you just need to make sure that you're not stepping on anything as you're doing it. 
at the very least, somebody could take a screenshot and they could throw it out there too. So you never know who you can trust on the other end and what they might do with things. So unless you want it to get out there, don't state it even on a direct message or a private message or whatever it's called on the social media app that you're using. Here's another thing if you're using a branded account, and I've used several, the Starling Tribune, uh, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., Better Podcasting, Gonna Geek. You need to set clear boundaries with those who have access to post and say, okay, it's okay to do this and this and this, but not this, this, and this. Full disclosure, I've not done that on every single branded account that I've had, but in retrospect, I wish I would have done that. It's the same thing of, Maybe you need to have a contract with co-host if you're going into the team in general and then have a separate conduct policy for your social media accounts. I think it's for the best for all involved, just so you know where that line is and so you don't get a rogue co-host that goes ahead and posts something that you would not want posted on social media. Or maybe it's something that you just don't want out there because it would affect your job or jobs of other co-hosts. So there's clear things that you cannot say in some cases, and you just need to make sure that those boundaries are stated to everybody that has access to the account. Here's something that we have run into recently, and it's passwords. And we've run into it recently because a lot of podcasters, at least in our circle, have been using LastPass Password Manager. That has been a nightmare in the last six to eight months. So in order to keep that from becoming too much of a problem, you should probably regularly cycle your password just as you would your bank account, especially if it is a user password sharing situation with your teammates, just in case somebody is compromised security wise. And also if somebody leaves your team, you want to be able to revoke that access as people can move on from your podcast and you just don't want them coming back out of nowhere and start posting stuff. And you're like, where who posted this? What's going on here? And by revoking the access or changing the password and only sharing it with the new people that have access or the new team that have access to it, you're protecting yourself against that. So the two big things you're protecting against if it's somebody that's on your team that you like, enjoy, and you want to continue posting is compromised security-wise. And then if somebody that has had access to the account in the past starts posting, you want to protect against those two things. There's one other consideration that I'm going to talk about with a branded account, and it's you might want a branded account because you personally don't like social media yourself or a certain type of social media. However, you recognize the need for it. For example, in the year 2023, there are endless reasons that certain people might not like certain social media companies. I'm not cycling. I'm not just saying one thing here. There's multiple social media companies that people can have issues with. However, if you're a podcaster, interacting with your audience becomes a pretty important part of it. And social media is almost an expectation for many listeners. So by creating that branded or that podcast account, you can maintain your offline personal life, but also keep a presence for your podcast. Okay. So now that you've kind of got the scope of your considerations, it's time to define your social media strategy. Before you start promoting your podcast on social media, it's important that you do this defining of your strategy. And this is for yourself. And if you've got a group of people, you want to make sure you're on the same page. If it's just you, well, at least you're putting your thoughts on paper. You want to identify your target audience and determine what your goals are going to be for your social media presence. Are you looking to increase downloads? Are you looking to grow your listener base? Are you just trying to drive engagement? Maybe a bit of all of the above. Essentially, what do you want to do with your social media presence in regard to your podcast? And when you're making your social media posts, what's the sort of message that you want to convey on those posts? Based off that, you're going to need to look to choose the appropriate social media platforms that aligns with that goal and, of course, your audience. You might look at things like Twitter or TikTok or Instagram or Reddit or the Facebook trademarks, kick SP off, maybe Mastodon, Discord servers, Tumblr, LinkedIn. Maybe there's some other social media out there that we haven't listed off where you are already active. 
basically take a look at what's going to be the best place for those goals that you've set out. And then time to start developing and publishing engaging content on that platform or those platforms. Social media platforms thrive on engaging content. And you want to start by creating a profile that reflects your podcast, but in an engaging way. You might need to take existing album art that you've got or podcast art that you're using and modify that for your profile on this social media platform. You might have a header that's available on a social media platform that you want to try to draw people in if they check it out. Maybe that's going to include some podcast information or your website in there. Heck, you might even need to determine what specific name you want to use on that social media platform. Obviously, it's probably going to be tied to your podcast if it's a brand account, but is there a little modification of the name that you're using that will draw better attention? Like maybe throwing the word fan cast in there or interviews or something like that, where you're, if someone's seeing a post that you're making and they see your name, it just gives a little bit of a leg up in order to draw people's attention. Of course, you need to also consider that there might be character limits involved while you're choosing that name. So you got to figure out what's going to be the best because just truncating your name might not be the easiest for people to figure out. Here we use better pod on Twitter. That's an example about it. But if we couldn't fit better pod in there, would we really go better po? Probably not. Pro probably not. <laughs> I mean, maybe PD, but that's police department in a lot of places in the world. I don't know. Uh, we didn't have to worry about it, so I'm not going to worry about it now. Another thing to aid you in developing and publishing engaging content is to create compelling and shareable content related to your podcast. This can be in the form of the ever prevalent these days audiograms, could be teaser clips. I've been doing a lot of those lately, and I've done them in the past, but I've kind of resurged into them. There's behind the scene footage that you can throw out there. Make sure that you add relevant graphics, whatever your content is. Uh, visual things seem, seem to be the thing with social media. It's not just textual anymore. And then any other related content you want to throw in there, maybe something from the industry, something from the industry that's been posted and or uh, a adjacent industry that's been posted. You want to throw it in there as well. But when you need to do this, you need to consider the platform you're on. For example, posting an audiogram to a text-based platform means your audio clip may be in the middle of a bunch of reading somebody is doing, so might not be the best thing to do. Or it could even be that you're on a system that doesn't really have a great ability to play audio. So remember that. So the audiogram can't be enough. You'll need to think of some accompanying text that will catch the reader and perhaps entice them to hit play. Otherwise, they're just scrolling right past it. Or putting an audio-only clip on a video platform like TikTok might not be the smartest thing to do. If you spent any time on TikTok, which I have not, you've probably seen people shoving their audio over random other video-like games and, and play videos, that sort of stuff. Just random, random entertaining clips. My son has sent me some of these and I scratched my head about them until I figured out it's just video overlaying the audio that's being played. And that's because TikTokers are looking for video. So that captivates them visually. Or maybe going on Reddit to post a link to your YouTube video. Well, Redditors are there to converse in a discussion type manner in a post comment sort of format. How can you frame the post to keep interaction on Reddit, but also to drive people over to whatever video you're trying to link to and maybe even your podcast from time to time? The key is creating valuable content for your podcast within the scope and norms of the social media platform. But it is important to still keep your target podcast audience in mind while you're doing this. It's all well and good to reach people on a social media platform. For instance, I'm just going to throw TikTok out there right now because a lot of people are transitioning to it. But it's pointless if they're not going to be your target target audience or be able to transition over to your podcast. You need to make sure your content is visually appealing. It resonates with your audience and it encourages them to take action. Okay, action, 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 action. I've said that about six different times. That's what you want them to do. 
What sort of actions do you want them to do? You want them to listen to your podcast. Maybe you want them to like, comment, and or share the post so that it gets more traction. Now, keep these actions down to one and then keep them consistent for a few weeks before moving on to another call to action. That's probably going to be the best because if you start interlacing different calls to action or different actions that you want them to take, then they're going to get confused or they're not going to remember to do it or they're not going to know what's they're supposed to be doing for you this week. And there's a lot of listeners that will do stuff for you. They're really involved in your podcast. They bought into it and they want to help you out. And if you give them 10 different things to do, it's just going to confuse them and they're going to go, okay, I'm just going to do the first one I run into and that's it. And it might not be the most important thing that you want done at that point in time. So just keep that in mind. Now, Stephen, once you start publishing, what's the most important thing? To be consistent, because consistency really is the key to building a strong social media presence. You need to establish a regular posting schedule and try to stick to it the best that you can. Because if you consistently share content related to your podcast, you're more likely that people are going to see that information, want to interact with you. And hopefully that's where you start to get in on that algorithm a little bit. You want to engage with the audience as well and try to respond to comments and messages in a timely manner. This is going to help build trust and loyalty with your audience. And again, some of these algorithms do favor that interaction. Of course, you want to engage your audience in a two-way manner on social media. You want to encourage interaction with your audience by asking questions, responding to comments and messages, and really just fostering discussions. If you engage in these conversations and address feedback and show appreciation for your listeners, this is going to help build a sense of community and it strengthens the relationship between you and your audience. And engage in content that is not strictly just about your podcast. Because if you're just strictly talking your podcast, just your podcast, not talking content, we're talking about your podcast. We'll call you Spammy McSpammerson and everybody else is going to call you Spammy McSpammerson as well because that's how you're going to come off. Wow. I know that's I said it. I dropped the gauntlet meta. right now. Man, Spammy McSpammerson. I know. All right. All right. So something else that can help you as you're engaging with your audience on social media is to utilize hashtags and keywords. If you use those relevant hashtags and keywords in your social media posts, it will increase discoverability because it will eat into at least a little bit of the algorithm that you're looking at for the social media that you're looking at. I would go ahead and I would research popular hashtags and keywords related to your podcast niche and then use them strategically in your post. There are capabilities out there like tagsfinder.com that will help you find those hashtags or tags that you can use in different social media. But more importantly, just pay attention yourself to the posts that you're seeing around you. What tags do the accounts use when they engage with you? Presumably, you'll find content that is to do with the topic of your podcast and then how did you find that? You'll just, you know, scroll down those tags and look and see what has been used and then maybe adopt some. And then if you find content through those tags, others may too. So the common use of tags is relevant. Now on Strange New Worlds fan cast, I'm covering Picard season three right now. It's not something that I normally do. So I'm not sure what the Trekkies are actually using for hashtags. And you can think, Hashtag Star Trek would be one. Okay, but there's others that probably point to each individual episode. Yeah, there is hashtag Picard season three. There's hashtag Star Trek Picard. There's hashtag Star Trek TNG. There's hashtag Star Trek Legacies because everybody wants there to be a follow on series and that has been named Legacies. Hashtag too much nostalgia, not enough plot. <laughs> Maybe that too. But the key is that you look at all those hashtags that everybody else is using, and then you start using those hashtags. And you can use those same hashtags on multiple different social media, and they'll probably get some traction. But it's a little bit of a see what's being used on this social media platform and see what's being used over here. And then you adapt. It was a 10 episode season for Star Trek Picard season three. So I had a few 
weeks to get used to the hashtags that everybody was using. I would say by the fourth week, I was pretty in it. So it took about a month. I'm just being honest with everybody. It took about a month to get that down. And hashtags, you bring up a great point because hashtags are something that also can help keep you timeless because people who might be checking out, say, this episode, this series of Picard going with what you were discussing later in the year, they might want to go and check out some other content much later once, you know, things have kind of settled down. And they're probably likely to go check a hashtag to do with it to look up some posts because it's not going to be as active in their feed. So by using hashtags, you are tagging yourself in there for people who might look in the future. And if you think I'm crazy, well, I am crazy, but not for this reason. I still randomly get posts on hashtag posts that were quite old. And and I get that on Mastodon. Back when I was on Twitter, I used to get a lot of them over there. And it's just amazing. It's out of the blue. You This old, old post comes up and you're like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I'll throw another one in there too. It doesn't have to be months or years in the future. It could just be that there happened to be a holiday break mm. in the middle there, but there was no break in the content. And in this particular case, I'm going to throw out spring break. There were a lot of people that were going on spring break in uh, one or two particular weeks during the season. I could clearly see that with the downloads because the downloads went down. So it's like, oh, okay. And then somebody comes back to school or back to work or whatever, and they're like, Huh, I wonder what happens. So they can look at the hashtags and they can get caught up on that. You're absolutely right. It doesn't have to be months in the future. It could just be days in the future. Those hashtags do help. So the tags themselves also can help you expand your reach and attract new listeners who are interested in your topic, but not, might not be part of your community at the time. So just remember that. So Stephen, there is another way that you can utilize social media. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll set the stage here because one of my favorite influencers is this guy that has this podcast. And, and sometimes he invites people on the podcast to talk about podcasting. His name is SP and he has guests frequently on his podcast. He is definitely my, my top number one favorite influencer. And Sometimes what he'll do on social media is actually collaborate with guests or other influencers in that niche to help cross promote the content on social media. And an idea about this would be, you know, if you have a guest on your podcast, you go and and you work out something that you're helping cross promote each other's content out there. So if they come on there, hopefully they'll promote being on on your podcast and then you would likewise go and say, "Hey, so and so from so and so podcast or so and so from so and so social media platform just guested this week. So it's a it's a mutual cross promotion. And I've seen a few back and forth over on the Twitter sphere with you and your guests on Better Podcasting Chats with SP, which by the way, if you're not checking that out, please go to betterpodcasting.com. Check out his podcast. It's awesome. This really helps both of you though tap into each other's audiences. And if you also are in a community of some form, there might be a central tag that's used to help promote. Back in the day, there was the Podern Family Twitter, that tag that used to be used. You might have something like that where a group of podcasts or, or influencers or social media folks use a shared hashtag to help each other promote a shared topic. And just to jump in here really quick, as far as the Better Podcast and Chats with SP, the primary goal of that was not to cross promote or get influencers in and increase the listenership or awareness of Better Podcasting. The primary purpose of that show was to get content about how to podcast and other people's hobby podcasting experiences out there for other hobby podcasters. That was the number one goal. A side effect of that was cross-promotion. It was never the primary goal, but I'm not going to quibble with the fact that it actually occurred just naturally because of the way it went. And that's why a lot of people do have guests and, and interview shows. Once again, that was not the primary purpose with Better Podcasts and Chats with SP, but I would be lying if I would say that it didn't happen at all. So there you go. Just take the compliment. You're my favorite influencer. Just take it. I'm not an influencer. <laughs> you are so funny. Okay. Another thing to do is analyze and adjust once you've been out there cross promoting, creating content, and you have your plan. Analyze and adjust. You need to track 
the performance of your social media efforts using analytic tools and adjust your strategy accordingly. And you're like, what are you talking about with analytic tools? Well, you need to monitor metrics such as engagement, reach, conversations, and you will start to understand what's working and what's not, and then make those data-driven decisions to optimize your social media promotion. Yes, I realize I'm talking like a corporate social media magna here, but all those stats are starting to be out there for engagement and everything on different posts on social media. It is not difficult to take a look at those and say, hey, look, this post got a lot of traction and then start to narrow down why it got a lot of traction. Was it the time of day? Was it the content that you were throwing in there? Was there hashtags in there that really got noticed? Was it different people that you tagged in the post that got noticed? I mean, you need to start making those data-driven decisions on what actually worked and what's not. And then how much can you do of one thing? Like if something worked one time, you like you tagged, I don't know, you tagged uh, Jean-Luc Picard or Patrick Stewart, right? <laughs> Since I have the Strange New Worlds fan, uh, fan cast podcast. And then he retweeted something and then boom, your tweet goes viral or whatever. Yeah, I, I get that you're going to be good on that one thing, but that doesn't mean you're going to start tagging Patrick Stewart on every single post. That's <laughs> It's just not going to work, right? So that's just an example of something that worked, but it was a flash in the pan. And then you got to work on something else that will be more sustaining over time. Now, SP, I'm going to say something controversial here. Okay. Oh, don't be afraid to dump a social media platform. Mm. As we've mentioned, you only have so much time to contribute to your podcast endeavors, including the social media aspect. If Facebook is meeting you with crickets, maybe try something else. If videos on TikTok are make, making you reach people that are kind of outside of your target niche, maybe you try something on Instagram similar. Or if SP is the only one following you on social media, well, really, that's all any of us need in life. So just be appreciative of that and just call that a win because you've really accomplished one of life's true rewards, if that's the case. You realize I'm going to get you back for all this <laughs> Now that we've gone through the strategic plan of what you should do with your social media account, here are some additional best practices for hobby podcasters with social media use. First of all, beware of potentially negative trends. A few years back, and I just say a few years back, but it was probably 10 years ago by now, there was this big thing on the scene called Twitter bombing. As I recall, it was one of the big things that Stephen and I took a look at and we're like, no, no, this is not good. And why we started Better Podcasting a couple of years later. Twitter bombing was simply uh, throwing the link to your podcast on multiple posts an hour. And I'm talking like 20 or 30 posts an hour to Twitter and that the bots would click on those links and that it would increase your stats up. And then you would run to advertisers and then they would go, oh, you have 20,000 listens on your podcast within the first three hours of you launching. I'm going to give you millions of dollars so that you can advertise with us. When in actuality, they were really hitting about 50 listeners out there. So that's what one of the impetuses was of the IAB podcast statistics, the podcast measurement standards that we have today. But it was bad for Twitter bombing because then once people realized what was going on and it occurred really fast because advertisers weren't getting the ROI on their money, that they started to eliminate all those posts from Twitter from the statistics. So it's just an example of something that is was a trend. It was a bad trend and it shouldn't have been started to begin with, but somebody found a loophole and then somebody ran with it. And then a bunch of copycatters said, this is the way to make money. And it happened, right? So you need to worry about that. And also you need to worry about new social media services, services that come online. They might be shiny and new, but they might not be the best use of your time. And again, I will throw TikTok in there. I have heard very, very few people that have created TikTok accounts for their podcast that can directly attribute growth to their podcast from TikTok, significant growth. Yes, there's a little bit of growth, but it's a lot of work. One of the people that has, does this is Anthony from Capes on the Couch, and he will admit that, yes, we get some interaction, but it is way too much work in order to get that interaction. So. 
Maybe you need to evaluate what is entailed with these new social media services before you jump in and think it's going to be a gold mine with little work, because that just doesn't sound right to me on many, many different levels. But also the other aspect of that is you want to make sure you're thinking back to your game plan. What is your goal? Because if your goal is to generate content that you can then use in your podcast, Maybe you're not looking at a place that is going to help you grow your listeners, but it's going to be somewhere that you're going to be more likely to interact with people. So if, say, that was TikTok and you're like a hot topic podcast and you know you go on TikTok, the algorithm's going to find you a bunch of different opinions that are probably going to hate them and generate that content, which then you can follow up with on your podcast, then that might fit. But like SB said, if your, your goal is listenership growth, that might not be the best place to go. As well, you're thinking in terms of a plan. Let's just talk about a weekly plan. Let's assume you have a podcast that's releasing weekly. I know not everybody does. Some people have a daily podcast. Some people have a podcast that release bi-weekly. Some people have a podcast that release on a monthly basis. Some people have a podcast that release whenever they actually get content done. Damien, I am looking at you and I am not blaming you whatsoever. Your podcasts are works of art. But If you have a podcast that go weekly, you need to have a plan. And I will just use, again, the Strange New Worlds fan cast. If you have a weekly tempo, there should be a weekly tempo to your podcast. The episodes release on Saturday. So what we as a team did is we promoted the link on Saturday and Sunday on social media. Then on Monday through Wednesday, there was a plan that wasn't always followed to release two teaser clips and share relevant articles and engage with listeners on those days. Now, Thursday is when the episode released. The episode released at 3 a.m. Eastern time, so it's basically the first thing in the morning. We did non-spoiler reactions to the episode, like, oh, this is good, or I have some thoughts, or can't wait to talk about this, that sort of thing. Non-spoiler, you don't want to spoiler anybody. And then on Friday, we were recording. So what are your thoughts? You know, get it into us. What did you think of the episode? That sort of thing. And then rinse and repeat started all over again on Saturday when the episode drops. That was a plan. Was it hard in stone? No. But just getting those teaser clips ready to go on Sunday night for the team to use throughout the rest of the week, you know, at least six of them, two each day, that was in the plan to do. And if you need to take time to create the content, to then throw on social media, that should be in some sort of plan. So plan for the week or plan for the month, you know, whatever your release schedule is, you should plan for it. And the other thing is don't only promote, oh my gosh, the account, I remember a few years ago, I was following several accounts on a couple of social media and all they did was promote their latest episode or their latest drop on YouTube or whatever. And as soon as I figured that out, I was like, no, this is clogging my feed, (laughs) unfollow or unsubscribe or whatever. So what we're talking about here is the nominal 80-20 rule. I I think it largely still applies, but it largely doesn't. I think it's more like 90-10 or maybe 95-5 these days. You want to promote like 80%, the 80-20 rule. And we talked about it before, is you want to promote only 20% of the time, but 80% of the time you don't promote. You don't link to your stuff at all. And you just have relevant conversations or throw some funny stuff out there or whatever. You are on topic, but you are not linking to your stuff. You're not saying, hey, look, I have a new episode out or go check out my website with all my podcasts on it or whatever. You don't want to do that. Followers want to be entertained by your post. Only promoting will get you unfollowed. I will do that. (laughs) And then be of use. Make sure that if you've got something, some little tidbit, that didn't make it into your last episode, but still relevant or whatever, put it out there. People will be appreciative of it. And another thing is set a time limit. This applies to anybody, I think, but especially hobby podcasters. You've got other things to do in your life. Don't let either your podcast or your social media consume all of your time. Breaks will help you keep your mind creative. At least they do with me. And short videos on a service like Instagram or TikTok can and do eat up a lot of time. It can take up to an hour or two, depending on what kind of video you're trying to throw together, to do a video for those services. And is that worth your time? 
I don't know. If you're not getting paid for it, you might as well be having fun with it. And then if you're doing something for two hours, I can think of other things that I want to do that would be fun instead of creating that video like varnishing or <laughs> watching paint dry or something like that. Not that I think video creation is all that bad. Steven, I know it's one of your fortes. You love creating video, but not everybody does. So you've got other things going on in your life, basically, and you need to set that time limit. Here's another thing. If you have a team, we talked about this before, designate primary account holders. We talked about a team being accessing to each social media, but designate somebody that's primary. Share the wealth around, but keep other aspects of your show going as well. You want to equal the time being expended by the team across the board. Editing takes X amount of time. Social media takes X amount of time. Research for the next episode or writing the script for the next episode takes X amount of time. So share that across the board if you have a team to podcast. If you're a team of one, then absolutely you need to limit the time that you're spending on social media because you have other things you need to do. But also you need to know who technically owns the account. This is like your podcast. If your relationships go sour, how is that all going to unfold? If you have a written agreement, it's a little bit easier to back out. I don't know how it would go. I know how it would go with like a podcast media host provider. I don't know if the same thing applies to a social media account. Like I've got this agreement. I'm supposed to be the owner of this. I don't know if they abide by that or not, but if you do have a written agreement and need to use it, maybe it can come in handy. You could also consider the idea of automated or scheduled posting services, but you really have to sort of limit that because they have their uses, but you can't overuse them. If all you're doing is sharing an old episode every two hours. Your followers will leave. Actually, they won't leave because you just won't have any because they'll all have left already. Uh, but you want to use it strategically to help keep the conversation going throughout the day when you can't post. But be aware, too, that a lot of these schedules, schedulers use an API and the platforms know that that is being done through an API and it's not an organic post. And some algorithms consider these sort of things and do affect the priority of these posts. So you kind of got to find that right balance. And if everything you're doing is scheduled, you might not have as much success as something that's a little bit more organic with you interacting in real time with people. So in summary, social media really is for hobby podcasters, and it can be a powerful tool when used. But we would advise you to be careful about how much time you spend on it with all the other things that you have to do related to your podcast. You need to make sure that you're balancing that time out and realize that you'll be one voice in a sea during a hurricane. So keep your expectations realistic. And for best results, use a social media strategy, including defining the strategy, developing and publishing engaging content, being consistent, engaging with your audience, utilize those hashtags and keywords, possibly cross promote with guests or influencers, and then analyze and adjust. And then also consider those best practices that we just ran down. And above all, we started this with this term. We're going to end this with this term. This is the most important thing that we say every week on Better Podcasting. Have fun. If you're not having fun, then it's just not worth doing, especially as a hobby. We got chatting over on our Discord a little bit about social media, and I just want to highlight one post here. I had asked people how they use social media, and uh, I'm just going to call him out because he's really the, the the de facto third host now of the Better Podcasting, Damien, the DM, because we mentioned him so much. Uh, he had said poorly, very poorly. So two things on that. Number one, hilarious reply, Damien. Made me laugh, literally out loud. Uh, second thing. What SP just said, have fun. If you're having fun, I will disagree with your assessment of it being poor, because if you're having at all any fun on social media, then it's not poor. I'd agree with that as well. If anybody has any interesting tidbits or wants to disagree with us on anything that we said about social media, please let us know. Our Twitter account is at betterpod, but we do have an email, podcast at betterpodcasting.com. And please join the conversation over on our Discord server at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. 
That's really where the bulk of the better podcasting conversation happens these days. And if you say something, we'll probably mention it on the podcast. And and the last place that I will suggest right now, and this is this is what I'm going to encourage you to do right now, actually, is create a TikTok video because SP is not on there, but I'll make sure that he sees it. So create a TikTok video with a dance, okay? With a dance as you are expressing that feedback to us make it post it out there and hey when you do that you'll also be promoting the show so i uh, go i go ahead and do that tiktok we don't have a tiktok but make it over there with a the dance i guess anthony's got something to do now <laughs> this is the better podcasting download one of the biggest topics i see out there on social media especially our podcasting which is a subreddit that i moderate over on reddit is failures in recording software this has become something that gets posted about four to six times a day, every day. And this failures in Zencaster not syncing up right, failures in Riverside not recording, failures in Ecaster or StreamYard, those type of services, right? And admittedly, Zencaster and Riverside get talked about the most, and things like Ecaster and StreamYard don't, but they all could possibly have the same issues. All these services have the ability to perform local multi-track recordings for audio and video. In addition to whatever software issues there might be with those services, let us just state right here and now that in case you don't know, these recordings are dependent on each participant's device and internet connection. They are not the service. They are dependent on whatever device you're using, whether it's a mobile phone, whether it's a tablet, whether it's a laptop, a PC, they are dependent on that to perform the local recording. So not only do you have to have a relevant hardware that's going to be able to do the recording and keep up with everything, but you're going to have to have a relevant internet connection in order to pass these files back and forth. It's not always the software's fault, especially if you're doing video. I see so many issues with video. I don't use the multi-track video recordings on StreamYard. I just use the one combined rec recording that goes out. And I do that intentionally. It's because of the limitations. I don't know if my co-host or my guest has the latest graphics card in their PC. I have no idea if they've had to reduce their internet speeds down below what would be considered good to pass back and forth even 720 video, let alone 4K video. I don't know. So this past week, I had a short exchange with the creator of Ecaster. I don't know if this is his real name or not, but he goes by Yanis Wesel or Weasel. And we talked about required hardware specifications for video recording. There's no hard and fast rule out there. I have not seen one yet that says, here are the minimum specifications. And it's because of all the factors involved. However, in talking back and forth, here is a good rule of thumb that comes from Yanis. Now, if you're recording via the GPU, which is the graphics card in your computer, it could be a laptop, could be a PC, whatever, you need to have a fairly, fairly modern graphics card, which is 2015-ish or later if it's a high-end card, or maybe for a low-end card, you're talking about 2020 or later. Like I said, not hard and fast. These are loose, but it does indicate that you can't use a laptop from 10, 12 years ago without a good graphics card in order to do that. If it's the CPU or the central processing unit, the actual processor is recording something in the six core or more with a 2.5 gigahertz or more speed range so that the encoding doesn't chew up all the resources. He doesn't even talk about RAM. You have to have enough RAM in there as well. I'm thinking 16 gigabytes of RAM at least, but Yanis didn't say that. Now note that high-end phones have encoding capable graphics cards. So any iPhone and a lot of Android phones from about 2015 or later are also capable. And that is from Yanis. We also discuss the internet and it basically comes down to quote, very fast internet, unquote. There is no qualification on that. It's just, quote, very fast internet. So if you happen to have a lowered tiered plans, or maybe you're on a community throttled access, maybe from a hotel or a dorm room, if you're in school or a coffee shop, you're going to have issues with the connection speed in order to do that video. So 
while these capabilities did not exist when we started podcasting and not even when we started doing better podcasting, we were still doing Skype, I believe, and going back and forth on that. They still have issues today and they have issues today because the back end technology with both the hardware and the internet connection speeds haven't caught up to where everybody thinks they should be. Like when we start, when I first started, I'll just say I, when I first started podcasting, I'm like, why can't I just use uh, something to record on my computer or Skype? Okay, SP, you go do that. I did. I lost three podcasts by doing it. And it was because the computer couldn't handle it. Now, I would bet that the computer that I have today would be able to handle what I was doing back then because it was just audio multi-track recording. But nowadays, if I was to do the same thing with everybody giving me 4K video, That's not going to happen. I know that's not going to happen because my internet connection is not fast enough because I don't have that available to me. I'm paying for the fastest speed that I can get today. And it's not good enough to handle those multiple 4K streams. So I just want to get that out there to everybody that it's not necessarily the cause of the service. It could be the cause of the people that are connecting. And thanks to Yanis for providing, pr- providing those details, because you and I have, have essentially assumed these sort of things before, but it's nice to have a developer actually give their side of things as well. Um, one of the things with the internet connection that I just want to throw out is keep in mind, you, you know, you might be a little more technical if you're doing podcasting, because generally podcasters are, are in some level a little bit technical, even if it's being able to go and post something. Well, if you're having guests on your podcast, they don't always know about Wi-Fi reliability either. So they might be like, oh, you know what? It's really quiet in the downstairs room that's hardly ever used at the back half of the house. And they got no Wi-Fi signal there or they have a really poor Wi-Fi signal and now they're cutting in and out. And that sort of thing causes problems as well. So the internet connection, I think I would be very curious what the actual numbers were as far as internet connection problems. Because with a lot of people using Wi-Fi and, you know, shoving shoving a Wi-Fi booster in a place where the Wi-Fi signal is weak, but then they see full strength. Uh, I, I would be very curious to see what the actual numbers are, because I have a feeling that poor Wi-Fi would probably be a lot of some of the problems we see. And one more thing about Yanis, because I forgot to mention it before. A lot of you already know or have used something Yanis has developed because... He's done more than eCaster. He was the original creator of the Craigbot over on Discord. <gasps> a lot of hobby podcasters have used Craigbot on Discord to record. And he left because the issues with Discord kept on multiplying. And he's like, look, I'm just going to take this off Discord and I'm going to create my own service. He did eCaster. A lot of people that use it really enjoy it. So I just want to throw that out there that what Yanis has created has been a big benefit to the community. Not the only guy that's done something that's been a benefit to the community, but I just want to throw it out there that eCaster happens to be one of the many that I recommend when people ask me, so what should I use? eCaster is one of them. And before we go to the better pod back, we're just got to acknowledge just right now that this past weekend, Rode announced a whole bunch of new gear. We're still waiting on information like prices, launch date, but it's, it's quite the focus on lower cost tech and before we get into the full list, I will just say that uh, I believe I have correctly predicted this many, many, many years ago because they did announce things like the Wireless Go 2 has a firmware update, that there's going to be a new version of the pod mic that has USB. They announced there's actually a Roadcaster backpack. They announced there's going to be a Wireless Go 2 charging case to help charge the Wireless Go they announced there'll be a update to the Roadcaster Pro 2 that actually allows the wireless go to to connect. But they also announced the Roadcaster Duo, which is basically a stripped down version of the Roadcaster. And why I say I predicted it was because I always, always said, why are they calling it the Roadcaster Pro when it's the only product with the name Roadcaster out there? Does that allude to the fact that there'll be other stuff eventually? Took us a while to get there, but hey, I like when my predictions or off the cuff BSing comes true. It is a stripped down version of the Roadcaster Pro 2. I think it has the same preamps and the same AFEX processing on board for DSP. 
So while it is stripped down, it should be the same core. Yeah. We're excited to see more about it. I have looked to see if it's even available on Sweetwater for pre-order or something like that. Nope. So no pricing, no launch date that we know of. On their website, they say more information and release dates for all of these products will be shared in the coming weeks. So we're talking a few months before we can see some of these things. And uh, Steven is throwing a big arms across for the X, for the Streamer X. Are you interested in the Streamer X or you just want to note? I, I just realized I forgot to mention they also announced okay. the Streamer X. So I had to yeah. make the X sign. <laughs> right. So, and this is predominantly focused on like streamers. Yeah. It's part of and, their uh, their new line, whatever their, their streamer line is. They've got a few. Well, different... I would say all of them are more focused on streamers, but there's a lot of applicability to podcasters. And this was announced at AMA, NAB, which is the Broadcasters Association versus podcast movement, I think for a reason, because podcasters aren't their core audience. It's definitely a served audience with all of this, but it's not their core audience. So I think that's where the money is, or at least that's where they think the money is. And they should know because they've sold a lot of Rodecaster Pro 2s and Rodecaster Pros over the years. Yes, they have gone down. I am still waiting for them to go up. At least six or eight XLR inputs. I think it would be more money, but there is constantly the, yes, I know you're going to say something, but there's constantly a need for six or eight for people that are doing like D&D podcasts or something like that. And uh, Stephen, there is a way now. Uh, I, I actually wasn't listening to you because I noticed BNH Photo has the pre-order price for the Roadcaster Duo. So, and, I, I, and it's four ninety nine US is what they've got on BNH Photo for that, and the Streamer ouch. X is three ninety nine. So that's more than I thought it was going to be. But I, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention because I was so excited about that. That's okay. I was talking about going bigger rather than smaller mm -hmm. and getting four. Uh, going up from four XLR inputs to six or eight, because a lot of D and D podcasters are like, "Well, my team is six. I need at least six, and maybe we have a guest. I'll need seven. How am I supposed to do that?" The Zoom P8 has been the standard response for all of that. But if the road wants to compete in that, they're going to have to go more. I have heard, and I don't remember the specifics, so bad on SP for not having this on the tip of my tongue. But I heard in the release video that you can actually start linking some of these together and you can expand like you could maybe link the duo with the Roadcaster Pro 2. I think maybe I could get that wrong. It, if I'm wrong, I expect to get some emails on this, but <laughs> I, I think that is a way for them to do it. However, you're talking $699 American for the Roadcaster Pro 2 and then $499. I was hoping it was $299 or $399, but $499 for the Roadcaster Duo. That's a big chunk of change. Now, it does come with some pretty awesome preamps and uh, DSP and all the effects in there. So, yeah, but $4.99 is a lot. Yeah. Especially and since you're going down in the sound pads from 8 to 6 and you're going down in the, uh, uh, the, the headphone jacks in and stuff like that. However, I will say, I think they learned from one of their mistakes because they put a TRRS jack on it Again, not just Bluetooth, and it's on the front, so you can have a front port on it. Which, like, why did you get rid of it with the Rocaster <laughs> Pro Two? I, I don't understand. That should have been in there. So they are backtracking on that. And before we go to the better pod, back uh, two quick things. Number one, uh, when I was said Road X, I was actually referring. I was looking up the name of it. The, there Stream actually X. is a uh, the Stream X. Yeah, there's actually a division called Road X, which is is their division that's geared towards streamers. And that's what I meant by the streamer X was, was part of that because there's actually a separate division. Like they've got, I think a USB version of basically the Procaster that's meant for streamers. They've got a couple other different mics on there. So that's what I was referring to. And then the second thing was, uh, I just noticed in our chat that I think technically Liberty dude did beat my discovery on seeing it on BNH. I did not see his post before I saw it on BNH online, but, I will give him credit because I think he beat us in the chat. So there you go, Liberty Dude over at Geeks.Live because we do stream this show live on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you very much, Liberty Dude. That was awesome. I did check Sweetwater. I checked it multiple times today, so I didn't think to check b and I did check Amazon, too. Nothing in either place. So thank you very much for checking B&H Photo. 
This is where we here at Better Podcasting turn the show over to you as we run through some of your feedback. We call this segment Better Podback. We just had a couple quick things to talk about today uh, in regard to the Roadcaster Pro announcements. Uh, we did have quite a bit of discussion over there. And um, Jason M. Bryant, he was excited about the Wireless 2 mics being able to pair directly to the Roadcaster Pro 2. He says that he's got some of those and that's going to be huge for him. Uh, we also had Newsreel say that he's been wanting a Roadcaster or a similar for some time, but he doesn't need the amount of input. So the duo looks like that might fit the bill. Um, I had commented that I noticed that on the pod mic, the new USB pod mic, it looks like there's there's actually foam over the grills and the plosives are a thing that a lot of people have commented on the pod mic. So it looks like they've learned about that. And there's just a bunch of excitement as this was sort of teased the, the weekend before it was announced and also as the announcement came out. So these are the type of discussions you're missing if you're not in our Discord server at betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. We'd love to have you over there. There's lots of great content over there. Yeah, and I just can't get over the fact that this gear is here because it didn't exist when we first started. It would be amazing, even at the price that it is today, to have it available 10 years ago. That was just awesome. But moving on from the road announcement, we had some back and forth on Pocket Casts, and Damien said, I'm not sure what special feature podcast offers, but for reference, the Podcast Attic subscription is $1 a month. So $30 a year versus $1 a month or $12 a year. I don't know what the capabilities are, but if you're going to pay, you might want to take a look at others than Pocket Casts out there. We also had some issues on crutch words. Yeah, this was a fun little post there that Jim Video posted. He said, over the years, I've learned that there are cr words called crutch words. Podcasters would spend hours or many dollars to remove these unwanted words. Um, Valerie Fridland, the guest for the current interview on the Alan Alda podcast, bestows the virtues of crutch words and vocal fries. Does she have a valid point? Alan said, nobody wants to be a linguistic dinosaur. So first, number one, I like throwing the um in there. That was fantastic. Uh, it's a crutch word that people use. I, it's one that I quite regularly use if you've listened to this podcast at all. But I think there's conversation to be had, especially in the idea of the definition of what a podcast is being evolving. I think there are people that might listen to a, a crutch word heavy or uh, an unpolished podcast. And, and that's their expectation of what a podcast is because it's a real down to earth interview or something like that or a down to earth conversation. And they might expect that. And they might not care whether you have crutch words or not. Now, there might be other people that do care and they want a more polished product. And I think that's where the broad definition of a podcast can go either way on this topic. Because if you are somebody who is expecting the quality of the high produced podcast, and then you go and you hear some people who are putting a loose conversation on YouTube that's kind, kind of rough, hard to listen to, has lots of stutters like the one that I just did and lots of crutch words they might be turned off of that. So that broad definition of podcast, I think, could lend itself favorably to this idea, or it might actually almost take away from the idea of having crutch words in there. So it could go either way to me. I think of it in terms of protecting the listener's time. There are so many podcasts out there. I definitely want to listen to more than I'm capable of. And if you're throwing some spaces in there or crutch words in that, should be taken out just because of time saving. I might consider moving on to a different podcast instead of listening to yours or waiting to listen to yours when I have more time. So the crutch words are definitely something that I take a look at because it tells me if you are invested in protecting my time or not. No other things about the content or the quality or anything like that could be a well-recorded podcast that sounds great and you're just having crutch words in there that could be taken out in post. I think that in my opinion, taking those out then protects my time and it makes me like you more <laughs> because I could fit you in my schedule more. And this is why for me, I think it's a fluid issue because I'll say I don't care. I, I as a listener, don't care at all if you have crutch words. Now, if it's excessive gaps, excessive 
lack of thought to your podcast. It, it, it's just a general idea where it's people coming to the table to record something and that's all they thought ahead of time. That's different. But for me, if if they've got a concept and there's crutch words, I'm more invested in the people and the conversation. And, and I'm just saying it as a counter to what you're saying, because I think we're great examples of of opposite type of listeners. And that's why I think, you know, some people it won't matter. Some people it will. And, you know, for you, I think it's a it's a very valid point. You as a listener, if you went to that podcast, you wouldn't listen. And that's the type of person, you know, SP is not alone on this. And and so if you don't do it, that type of listener, you're probably going to lose. So to me, I think it's still mostly worth it if you've got the time to be able to edit them out because you're not going to probably alienate people by not having crutch words. If it's over edited, you might, but you're not going to alienate people by not having crutch words, but you might alienate some that that do care. I will put it in the like format since you said it could go either way as a not for safe for work podcast, may, uh, basically a podcast that has uh, profanity in it. Mm. I am not against that. However, I know some people are. And a matter of fact, there's a podcast that I know of that uh, had a guest on that is used to swearing and the podcast was considered safe for work. And there was so much swearing that a few were let through. There are ways to get around this, by the way, and I'll get into that in a second. But the audience commented back several people in the audience. So he was like, no big deal. I'm just going to let this out. Several people in the audience wrote back to him the day it was released and said, you missed some and here's where it is. And I was like, huh, interesting. So he went back and he redid it. An easy way to do it is to use a capability for transcripts that gives you a time code. So I've been using this just DIY solution which is called Rev Red Olv Ive. It's R E V O L D I V dot com. And you can throw your file in there and it will give you a transcript with time codes. And then you can go ahead and take it out. So you could search for the profanity and just know to either take it out or beep it or whatever. You can easily find it. If you're not one that edits your podcast, but finds yourself wanting to be safe for work then that is a way to do it. We'll put the link in the show notes. It's just an easy way to find them, at least. Maybe, you know, you listen through, but you got distracted for 10 minutes and you didn't listen to the whole thing and there was a, a couple of swear words in there. That's what we're talking about here. And w- once again, I don't care either way, but I could see how this can apply to the same exact issue of crutch words or no crutch words. There are people that are pro and there are people that are con. So we'd love to know your thoughts. Get in touch with us through any of the ways, including making a dancing TikTok all about this, tagging Better Podcasting, which doesn't have a TikTok, but you can go ahead and drop our URL and advertise for us for free and then send it to me and I will make sure that SP sees it, even if I have to carry or pigeon it to him. I will laugh my butt off. (laughs) (laughs) So that's going to go ahead and do it for another episode of Better Podcasting. We would love to have you chat with us over at betterpodcasting.com. And while you're over there, if you are using the Roadcaster Pro 2, we'd love to know, are you having issues with it still? Because we did have Josh Liston actually mention that he had an issue with the SD card, which is one that SP has mentioned before on Better Podcasting, but it might be all about the amount of time left and being an inaccurate timer. But we want to try to track this down. So please, if you are, let us know. Have you seen anything weird with the amount of time left? The counter basically on the Roadcaster Pro 2. Yep, I've had a great time talking about the audience. We'll talk more about the audience next week, Stephen. And it has been a blast. So for episode number 275 of Better Podcasting, I'm Stephen saying check out betterpodcasting.com. Find our contact information there. It doesn't have a TikTok, but maybe if you dance, I'll make one. No. I'm SP, and I hope you're having fun with your hobby podcast. Let us know if you have any comments. I'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks for checking out another episode of Better Podcasting. You can find the full back catalog of Better Podcasting at betterpodcasting.com. If you're into geeky podcasts, 
Please check out the other podcasts on the Gunna Geek Network at gunnageeknetwork.com. This show was produced and edited by Stephen John Drew. Voice work was done by L.W. Salinas. Thanks again for listening or watching, and we hope to see you again next week.